Welcome to another episode of Eric Quay Whiskey Studies. And in this video, I'm gonna talk about the history and core range of Cobagan and Cooley Distillery. So you may wonder, why am I trying to cover two distilleries in one video? Well, uh, if you search around on the internet and look at the core range of uh, Kilbegan and Cooley Distillery, you might get a little confused there because you're going to see Kilbegan sometimes on the core range listed for Cooley. I mean, why is that the case? Well, uh, the reason is these two distilleries historically are symbiotic. And it can get a little bit confusing when you're looking at the history and trying to do two separate videos of one uh, and then of the other, you can't do a history of one without at least mentioning the other. So I thought uh, in terms of chronology and seeing how these two relate and see how they developed and then how they were then reflected in their core range would be maybe a little bit more clear if I actually presented it in one video. So if you're into uh, studying the history of whiskey and understanding the brands of uh, what we drink and why they are the way they are, then you're going to want to stay tuned and uh, follow along uh, in this video. So we begin with Kilbegan Distillery, which some argue is the oldest distillery in Ireland, but Bushmills Distillery with their 1608 date on their bottles would argue otherwise but that's a debate for uh, another video. So Kilbegan Distillery is located on the River of Bosna in Kilbegan, County Westmeath, Ireland, right sort of in the middle of Ireland. The name Kilbegan is derived from St. Beckin, uh, one of the 12 apostles of Ireland who founded a monastery in the area in the sixth century. So Kilbegan Distillery was founded in 1757 by Matthew McManus. It was a small pot still distillery. And the license to distill dates all the way back to 1757, which is why they claim to be the oldest. A copy of this is actually can be seen at the distillery. Although information about the early years of the distillery is scarce, documentation suggests that in its early years, the distillery operated with a 230 gallon still and an annual output of 1500 gallons. By the early 19th century, the distillery was being run by John and William Codd. In 1841, Kilbegan Distillery was put up for sale following the dissolution of the partnership between its then owners, William Codd and William Cuffey. The distillery at the time consisted of a brew house, still house, and three pot stills, a run room, and five receivers, a malt house, corn stores capable of storing 5,000 barrels, and oatmeal mills. Also listed in the sale were 4,000 tons of coal and 10,000 boxes of turf, the latter reflecting the immense quantities of turf consumed at the distillery, so much so that it was reported to have kept hundreds of poor people profitably employed in cutting, rearing, and drying it to the town throughout the year. In 1843, the distillery was taken over by John Locke. This is not the 17th century British philosopher under whose stewardship the distillery flourished. Locke treated his staff well and was held in high regard by both his workers and the people of the town. Informal records show that under Locke, the distillery provided cottages for its employees, either for rent or purchase, through a form of in-house mortgage scheme. In addition, all staff received a wagon load of coal at the start of each winter, the cost of which was deducted from salaries retrospectively on a weekly basis. In 1866, following an accident on site, which had rendered a critical piece of equipment, the steam boiler, inoperable, the distillery had come to a standstill. With Locke unable to afford or obtain a loan to find a replacement, the future of the distillery laid in doubt. However, in a gesture of solidarity, the people of Kilbegan came together and purchased a replacement boiler which they presented to John Locke along with public letter of appreciation, which was printed in several local newspapers at the time. In a public response to mark the gift, also published in several newspapers, Locke thanked the people of Kilbegan for generosity, stating, I feel this to be the proudest day of my life. A plaque commemorating the event hangs in the distillery's restaurant today. 
And one of the things I've really enjoyed in studying whiskey, whether you're talking about Scotland, Ireland, or Texas, is that there seems to be a symbiotic relationship between uh, the distillery and the people. Uh, people really get behind the distillery, not just because, yeah, they're dependent on it for employment, but they take a sense of pride that this distillery uh, reflects them, reflects their, their place, and people around the world are enjoying something that comes from their hometown. Um, you can find today, for example, uh, distilleries that are actually um, co-funded by people contributing funds to get the distillery into operation. In fact, uh, there's a crowded barrel down there in Austin, which is uh, completely uh, paid for by its contributors. In 1878, a fire broke out in the sampling room, or can dip, of the distillery and spread rapidly. Although the fire was extinguished within an hour in destroying a considerable portion of the front of the distillery and caused 400 pounds worth of damage. Hundreds of gallons of new whiskey were also consumed in the blaze. However, the distillery is said to have been saved from further physical and financial ruin through the quick reaction of the townsfolk who broke down the doors of the warehouses and helped roll thousands of casks of aging spirit down the street to safety. In 1887, the distillery was visited by Alfred Bernard, a British writer, uh, for, during his research for his book, The Whiskey Distilleries of the United Kingdom. By then, much and large distillery was being managed by John's sons, John Edward and James Harvey, who told Bernard that the distillery's output had more than doubled during the preceding 10 years and that they intended to install electric lighting. Bernard noted that the distillery, which he referred to as the Brusna Distillery, named for the nearby river, was said to be the oldest in Ireland. According to Bernard, the distillery owned five acres and employed a staff of 70 men with the aged and sick pensioning off or assisted. At the time of his visit, the distillery was producing over 157,000 proof gallons per year, although it had the capacity to produce 200,000. The whiskey, which was sold primarily in Dublin, England, and the colonies, was old pot still, producing using four pot stills, that is two wash stills, and two spirit stills, which had been sold by Miller and Company in Dublin. Bernard remarked that at the time of his visit, over 2,000 casks of spirit were aging in the distillery's bonded warehouses. In 1893, the distillery ceased to be privately held and was converted to a limited stock company, trading as John Locke and Company Limited with a nominal capital of £40,000 per year. Now, the history of Cobagan Distillery, like all Irish distilleries, at some point comes to uh, a decline. A number of different factors contributing to uh, the demise of the Irish whiskey industry. But fortunately, now in the 21st century, we're seeing um, a renaissance in the Irish whiskey. But it's important to understand uh, the challenging times of Irish whiskey, as and Scotland did as well. Scotland had a very challenging times as did the United States due to prohibition, war, and other uh, political and economic factors. But let's get into the sort of decline of Kilbegan Distillery. In the early part of the 20th century, Kilbegan, like many Irish whiskey distilleries at the time, entered a period of decline. This was due to the combined effects of loss and hampering of market access due to the prohibition in the United States, the trade war with the British Empire, shipping difficulties during world wars, and Irish government export quotas, as well as competition from blended scotch and disruption to production during the Irish War of Independence. As a result, from 1924 to 1931, Kilbegan was forced to cease production of new spirit for seven years, decimating the company's cash flow and finances. Most of the staff at the distillery were laid off, and the distillery slowly sold off its stocks of aged whiskey. In the 1920s, both John's sons passed away, John in 1920 and James in 1927, and ownership of the distillery passed to Locke's granddaughters, Mary Evelyn and Florence Emily. However, by then the distillery was in need of repair, with the turbulent economic conditions of the early 20th century having meant that no investment had been made in the new plant since the 1890s. Distilling resumed in 1931 following the end of prohibition in the United States 
and for a time the distillery's finances improved, with a loss of 83 pounds in 1931, converted to a modest profit of 6,700 pounds in 1939. In 1947, the locks decided to put the distillery up for sale. Although the distillery was run down, it had stocks of mature whiskey, a valuable commodity in the post-war Europe. An offer of 305,000 pounds was received from a Swiss investor funded by an Englishman going by the name of Horace Smith. Their unstated interest was not the business itself, but the 60,000 gallons of whiskey stocks, which they hoped to sell on the black market in England at 11 pounds a gallon, thus more than doubling their investment overnight. However, they failed to come up with the deposit, and the duo were arrested and promptly interrogated by Irish police. The Englishman, it turned out, was an imposter named Maximo, who was wanted by Scotland Yard. The Irish authorities placed Maximo on a ferry back to England for extradition, but he jumped overboard and escaped with the help of unknown accomplices. An Irish opposition politician named Oliver Flanagan subsequently alleged under parliamentary privilege that members of the governing Fianna Fáil political party were linked to the deal, accusing then Irish, I'm not sure how I'm going to pronounce this, Tuish Eamon de Valera and his son of having accepted gold watches from the Swiss businessmen. A tribunal of inquiry discounted the allegations, but the damage contributed to Fianna Fáil's defeat in the 1948 election. In addition, as the scandal remained headline news in Ireland for several months, it discouraged interest from other investors in the distillery. Thus, with no buyer found, operations continued at the distillery with production averaging between 120 and 150,000 proof gallons per year and consumption running at between 15,000 and 20,000 barrels. In addition, although heavily indebted, investments were made in new plant and equipment. In 1952, the Irish government introduced a 28% hike in excise tax duties on spirits, causing a drastic decline in domestic whiskey sales. By November 1953, the distillery could not afford to pay the duty to release whiskey ordered for Christmas from Bond, and production was forced to come to a halt. Although distilling had stopped, the firm struggled on until the 27th of November 1958, when a debenture issued in 1953 fell due, which the distillery could not afford to pay, forcing the bank to call in the receivers thus bringing to an end 201 years of distilling in the town. In 1962, the distillery was purchased for 10,000 pounds by Karl Heinz Moller, a German businessman who owned a motor distribution company in Hamburg. Moller made a substantial profit on the deal by selling off the whiskey stocks, about 100,000 gallons, worth tens of thousands of pounds alone and a rare Mercedes-Benz owned by the distillery. Much to the dismay of the locals, Mulder proceeded to convert the distillery into a pigsty, smashing thousands of lock earthenware crocks, which would be worth a substantial amount at auction today to create a hardcore base for the concrete floor. In 1969, the distillery was sold to Paris Green, a firm which sold Volvo loading shovels and in the early 1970s, the stills and worms were removed and sold for scrap. And thus, the end of the history of Kilbegan Distillery. Or is it? Well, fortunately, the distillery, by the townspeople, would be brought back to life. In 1982, almost 30 years after the distillery ceased operations, the Kilbegan Preservation and Development Association was formed by locals in the town using funds raised locally. The association restored the distillery and reopened it to the public as a whiskey distillery museum. But at this point, production hasn't started. So it's at this point in history that we're actually going to shift from Kilbegan, which is sort of now an existing but dormant distillery that needs to be fully brought back to life with some serious investment, which takes us to the history of Cooley Distillery. In 1985, John Teeling, 
bought a former Schnapps potato alcohol plant on the Cooley Peninsula in County Louth, Ireland. Two years later, 1987, John Teeling converted the potato alcohol plant to Cooley Distillery. Then, the newly opened Cooley Distillery acquired the assets of Kilbegan Distillery, allowing Cooley to relaunch whiskies under the Kilbegan and Locks whiskey brands. Cooley later took over the running of the museum and began the process of refurbishing a working distillery on site. Cooley were aided in the process by the fact that since the distillery's closure, each subsequent owner had faithfully paid the five pound annual fee to maintain the distilling license. In 1998, Cooley received a trophy at the International Wine and Spirit Competition for outstanding quality and for earning an impressive reputation over time. Cooley Distillery was the first distillery to be awarded the IWSC trophy. Now, under Cooley, Kilbegan begins to resume production. In 2007, 25 years after its restoration, on the 250th anniversary of the distillery's founding, distillation resumed at Kilbegan. The official firing of this pot stills was witnessed by direct descendants of the three families, the McMunzes, the Cods, and Locks, who had run the distillery during its 200-year distilling history. One of the two pot stills installed in the refurbished distillery was a 180-year-old pot still, which had originally been installed at the old Tullamore Distillery in the early 1800s. It is the oldest working pot still producing whiskey in the world today. In 2010, with the installation of a mash tun and fermentation vats, Kilbegan became a fully operational distillery once again. All right, so at this point, we now have Cooley Distillery having re brought back to life uh, Kilbegan Distillery and now both operating distilleries. So some of the slightly older Kilbegan bottles actually produced under Cooley and then some later bottles, uh, I think that first release was in, like in 2014, uh, would come under Kilbegan. So there are going to be some older Kilbegan bottles that came under Cooley and so Kilbegan, some Kilbegan bottles um, produced under Kilbegan and they've now expanded their uh, core range. But we'll get into that in just a minute because this is not the end of uh, these two distilleries just sort of living happily ever after because as in the way of many other things, someone else comes in and buys them both. On the 16th of December 2011, Beam Incorporated announced plans to purchase Cooley for around $95 million or 71 million euro. A month later, on the 17th of January 2012, the sale closed. Two years later, on the 30th of April 2014, Beam was then purchased by Suntory Holdings of Osaka, Japan, and Cooley Distillery became a Beam Suntory subsidiary. Following the sale, John Teeling went on to found the nearby Great Northern Distillery, while his sons Jack and Stephen established the Teeling Distillery in Dublin using stock acquired from Cooley under the terms of sale agreement with Beam. Uh, and so uh, this begins a whole other branch of the history of these distilleries uh, with uh, Teeling Distillery. And I'll get into that into another video uh, and I'll get into these whiskeys as well. Today, Kilbegan Distillery includes a restaurant, the Pantry Restaurant, and a 19th century water wheel which has been restored to working condition. The distillery can also be powered by a steam engine, which is in working condition but rarely used. It was installed to allow the distillery to continue operating in times of low water on the river. Prior to the recommencement of the operations of Kilbegi, the three brands associated with the distillery Kilbegan, Lox Blend, and Lox Malt were produced at the Cooley Distillery in County Louth before being transported to Kilbegan, where they were stored in a 200-year-old granite warehouse. However, following the recommencement of operations at Kilbegan, new whiskey produced on site has been sufficiently mature for market since 2014. So as I said, you can find some older bottles of Kilbegan coming from Cooley, and more recent releases coming actually from the Kilbegan distillery. In late 2009, the distillery released small three-pack samples of the still-developing New Make Spirit at one month, one year, and two years of age. 
In Ireland, the year must be a minimum of three years before it can actually be called whiskey. Now that we've covered the history of Cobagan and Cooley Distillery, and sort of introduced the uh, beginnings of the history of Teeling Distillery, we want to get into the core range of these distilleries. All right, let's begin with the Kilbegan core range. Our first up is the Kilbegan small batch rye Irish whiskey. It is double distilled. It is 100% distilled and matured on site, made from 70% malted and unmalted barley, 30% rye, bottled at 43% alcohol by volume, and sells for anywhere between $33 and $41 here in the United States. Now, I know what you're thinking. Hey, doesn't a rye have to be 51% uh, rye in order to be called a rye? Well, those are for American rye. It doesn't apply to Ireland. Our next up is the Kilbegan Blended Irish Whiskey, which I've got here in this bottle, which I'll be reviewing in another video. It is a blend of grain and malted barley. It's double distilled, aged in X bourbon cast. It is a non-A statement, bottled at 40% alcohol by volume, and sells for around $23. Our next is the Kilbegan Single Grain Irish Whiskey, formerly marketed as Green Ore. It is a blend of 94% corn, 6% malted barley. You always have to have a little bit of barley for the enzymes in order to um, convert starches to sugar. It is aged in ex bourbon casks and different fortified wine barrels. It's bottled at 43% alcohol by volume and sells for about $30. And the next is the Kilbegan Single Pot Still Irish Whiskey. It is double distilled in copper pot stills made from malted and unmalted barley, plus 2.5% oats, Asian X bourbon cask, bottled at 43% alcohol by volume, and sells for about $45. All right, now we wanna look at the Cooley Distillery brands, and I've got a few of them here, which I'll be reviewing in other videos. We begin with the Tyre Connell Single Malt. It has a non-age statement, Asian X bourbon cask, Early releases were bottled at 40% alcohol by volume. It is now bottled at 43% alcohol by volume and sells for about $42. Then we have the Tyra Connell 10 year old sherry cask, aged for 10 years in ex bourbon cask, plus two years in cherry cask, bottled at 46% alcohol by volume and sells for around $99. Then we have the Tyra Connell 10 year old port cask, aged 10 years in ex bourbon cask then finished in port cast for six to eight months. Bottled at 46% alcohol by volume, it sells for around $99. There's the Tyre Connell, 10 year old Madeira cast, aged 10 years in ex-bourbon cast, finished in a Madeira cast, bottled at 46% alcohol by volume, and sells for about $99. Then we have the Tyre Connell, 16 year old single malt, aged 16 years in ex-bourbon cast, bottled at 46% alcohol by volume and sells for around $89. Then we have the Tyra Connell 16 year old Oloroso and Moscatel cast, aged 16 years in ex bourbon cast, then finished in Moscatel cast from Andalusia, Spain, bottled at 46% alcohol by volume and sells for around $81. And I've got a bottle of that here and I'll be reviewing that in another video. Then we have the Connemara Single Malt Peated Irish Whiskey. It is double distilled, aged in bourbon cask, and there are a number of bottlings. There is a non-age statement, which I have here and will be reviewing in another video. The single cask, the cask strength, which I have here, a 12-year-old high peated version called Turf Moor. The non-age statement is bottled at 40% alcohol by volume, sells for $39. Uh, and this uh, cash strength is uh, bottled at 57.9% alcohol by volume. Cooley Distillery has another brand called Two Gingers Irish Whiskey, sort of an entry level whiskey. It is a blended whiskey founded in 2011 by Minnesota bar owner and businessman Karen Fulliard. The Two Gingers Whiskey Company was acquired by Beam Incorporated a year after the product was initially released. It is a blend of Irish single malt and grain whiskey. It is double distilled. Aged in X bourbon cast sells for $16 and is bottled at 40% alcohol by volume. Cooley also released a single pot still poaching, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which was available at the Celtic Whiskey Shop in Dublin and at Dublin Airport with the intention of expanding production to release it in other markets such as the United States. However, this has since been discontinued. Similarly, Michael Collins, a single malt whiskey produced for the U.S. market, 
was discontinued after the distillery was bought by Beam in 2012. However, there is word of the brand being picked up by Sazerac. All right, so I hope you have enjoyed this video and learned from it. I look forward to getting into these and reviewing these and other bottlings uh, from these distilleries in other videos. Uh, if you like my content and you have not yet subscribed, I'm asking you to subscribe. Give this video a thumbs up and ring the bell to be notified when I go live. And I look forward to doing a review of these whiskeys and, and other bottlings uh, in the near future as well. Uh, if you are one of my patrons, I want to thank you very much uh, for becoming a part of my little group. And until next time, cheers.